Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the last day of Second Dev. Congratulations from hanging in till the end. So, what I used to do at the end of Second Dev was give um, an overview on crypto developments, because cryptography is a world that moves fast, and every year new ciphers are being broken, or new standards are being set, or competitions end. But uh, last year we had the idea of discussing what the implications are of Snowden revelations on cryptography, because there is also quite some um, revelations by, made by Snowden which, which do impact crypto. Um, so in the end, this is an evolved version of this lecture because it, it turned out that I think it was put on YouTube and many people saw it, so I think I've given it now many times since, and it's been evolving, of course, because there is new revelations and because I've been discussing with other people as well. So. More or less, I'll try to summarize the revelations in a couple of slides. For those of you who have not been paying attention, get an overview. Um, I guess all of you know who Snowden is, right? I don't have to explain that, just, for, just to be sure. Then we go a bit more in details. Um, then we look at how the NSA is going after crypto. And I think it's very uh, useful and interesting to better understand threat models, because I think the main message is that the threat model which we had in mind may have been not strong enough. And so as a community, we have to think about this. Okay. And then we'll look at implications on, on research and policy. So the NSA um, is grew out of intelligence during World War I and II. So the, the US had intelligence agencies. At some moment, um, a US president said, um, we don't need intelligence agency, gentlemen don't read each other's mail. This was, this is how the, the black chamber at that time was abolished in the twenties. But so during World War II, the capability was built up again and then the NSA was founded. Initially the NSA was secret. Um, so it was known as no such agency. But if you look at pictures today, it's kind of very hard, hard to hide this because there is like, uh, you can go to Google maps and see that five or 10,000 of cars parked there every day. It's kind of hard to hide, okay. So the books about the NSA since the 80s. Um, and so now even there was a motel at the corner of this big intersection leading to the NSA. And this is now the NSA museum, which I can warmly recommend if you ever are in the neighborhood of Washington DC to go and visit. It's the only museum um, I know where they let you play with Enigma machines. In most other museums, you can look at it behind glass, but they let you play with it because they have so many. Okay. So. The NSA has two roles. One role is intelligence analysis, collection of communications and signals intelligence. And then, so this is the offense. And then the other role is defense. And inside organizations with two roles, there is always a conflict. And it seems that they've been doing much more in offense than in defense. You can also argue that in cybersecurity, um, offense is easier than defense because you have many layers of a system, and if you make one mistake, the, the bad guy is in. While in offense, you just need one success. But if you look at the whole thing, they seem to have gone very far in the offense side and been harming the defense side. So they have big antennas everywhere. They collaborate with the five eyes. Five eyes is UK, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. They have intercept sites all over the world. And here you see the data facility built in Utah, uh, which is a huge data processing facility for it's the NSA cloud, more or less. And by the way, this facility was described on Wikipedia long before the Snowden revelation. So it's not that Snowden suddenly told us what the NSA was, uh, but he did tell us some very interesting things. By the way, for us cryptographers, the NSA was not something new. Uh, they've been coming to our conferences. They've been trying in the 70s and 80s to stop research in cryptography several times. So in the U if you were living in the US, it was very difficult to get funding as a professor. Um, Diffie and Hellman were told by their colleagues in Stanford like, and by other colleagues, you're nuts that you try to work on cryptography, you'll end up in trouble. Okay, there were, there was a Davida case who wrote a paper on block ciphers and his patent was hit by a secrecy order. So he could no longer publish his work and so on and so on. So there was a, a long time fight with the academic community. They always came to our conferences they never spoke, they only listened. Um, the, the first time NSA actually spoke at a conference was at Crypto. 
I think 92 or 93, probably 92, and they tried to push the DSA standard. It was the first time an NSA guy gave a talk at crypto. Um, so since then, actually, since the Snowden revelations, the NSA has become much more active, and um, many conferences, they, they come there and defend their actions. It's very interesting. I'm not very happy with the way they defend it, but um, they now speak up for the first time. And there is a, I think, interesting debate going on in uh, the notice of the American Mathematical Society, because the American mathematicians, they actually get every year a big grant from the NSA, and they can give it to poor mathematicians to do research. Because they're not the, the best funded scientists um, uh, in general, mathematicians. And so there is a big debate among US mathematicians whether they should keep accepting money from the NSA or not. And so there is a debate in the columns of uh, the notices. Very interesting, and also the NSA is writing things there. Okay, so the summary of the Stone Revelations is that the NSA has very well understood its offensive tasks and is doing it very well. And the slogan is collect it all, know it all, exploit it all, with the emphasis on all. Okay? So I think if you read the literature, you read the books, you looked at what was known, uh, looked at what was in reports of the Echelon report, so the European Parliament. Um, as a consequence of a study done by a journalist called Duncan Campbell, started an investigation on Echelon. Echelon is the, one of the worldwide intercept systems run by the Five Eyes. And the European Parliament did an excellent report. There was just one bad coincidence. This report appeared a few days before 9-11. In fact, nobody paid attention to this report and nothing happened to it. So if you then looked at the parking lot, you know, the budgets are in the order of you know, 10 billion or something like this. Uh, the NSA is the largest employer of mathematicians in the world. You, can also, you would also guess that the NSA is trying to employ hackers and so on. So if you would have been thinking carefully, you could probably have predicted that they would be a very powerful adversary. But still, I think the massive scale, the numbers, and I will show you some numbers, are really impressive. Also, the impact they have is really surprising, I think, even for experts who have been looking at this. The NSA is also extremely sophisticated, both technically and organizationally. So we have no indication at this moment that they're real geniuses, but we have a clear indication that they're very competent at what they're doing. Okay? They're not just a bunch of amateurs. They're really very good and very well organized and structured. Okay? I'll give you one example. The NSA had at least three ways to get at Google's data. So we learn about defense in depth. Well, this is offense in depth. It means if your opponent adds a defense measure, you still have two other things. And this is three things we know of. So maybe they had other ways of getting at the data. OK, I'll explain you all the ways we know of. Um, the response to the NSA revelations is actually, in my view, surprisingly muted. And in particular, politicians don't say very much. Members of parliament shout. but actually politicians in charge are very quiet about it and always try to divert the attention of the debate. The only time when there was really a high profile response was when Merkel's phone got eavesdropped and Merkel uh, made some comments, but for the rest, the politicians <coughs> in charge are very, very quiet. And I will explain you why this is, because in fact, they're all implicated in the part of the game. Um, perhaps more surprising to some of us is that the industry is also massively collaborating. And US presidents, starting with Clinton, have asked the industry to collaborate. Also, Obama has asked this and keeps asking to do this, to because in fact, cybersecurity or e-security um, is a battle on the internet. And the ISPs run the internet, and the Googles, and so on, and the Netflixes. They use the internet. They have all the data. So it turns out that industry has been massively collaborating, um, either by bribery, by getting large sums of money. In the Verizon case, it seems just out of pure kindness of Verizon. Okay, but then there also has been, have been cases of security letters, which is something we didn't know before Snowden, at least I was not aware of this. So the US government can ask, can send a letter to a company and say, please give us your keys or your data, and if you speak about it, your executives go to jail. So in fact, as open society, you'll never find out what's happening because the company is forced to give up its data, and if it doesn't do it, or if it speaks about it, even about it, it goes to, the executives go to jail, and so this is what executives don't like in general. So for cryptographers, the most annoying thing was the undermining of cryptographic standards by putting backdoors in particular in one standard we know of. But of course, there may be more. We don't know about that. 
So at the same time, they also ruin the credibility of NIST. Now, the fact that NSA had an agenda in standardization is not secret. I've been very active in the ISO Committee on Security Techniques since 1990. The last year, I've been too busy to go there, but some of my postdocs or students go there. And from day one, the NSA was present there and had clearly had its own agenda. They know what they want, and they try to push and manipulate and be involved. Uh, if there is an important standard for them, they will make sure that, that they have an editor who makes the final decisions and so on. So they're very uh, organized there. Okay? What is most spectacular um, is very interesting is active defense. So there is this saying that the best defense is an offense. Well, what they really do is active defense. Um, and I will explain it in detail. What I find interesting is now that the companies are now using the same slogan. And active defense is not, I would say, hacking back, but it's more or less controlling networks completely. Who has heard about quantum insertion? Only two people. So quantum insertion is actually a very simple technique, and apparently, according to the latest documents, it's no longer that widely used, but it's still being used. And it's extremely simple. If you enter in your browser google.com, okay, it's not Google who answers, it's the NSA. And how can they do it? They're just faster. They sit on the network and they answer before Google can. Okay? From that moment on, you believe you're at Google. Of course, you're at the NSA. What they do is they redirect you to a Fox Asset server, which is a malware injection service. This service looks at how important you are, how sophisticated you are, and depending on this, you get certain malware. The good news for you guys is that the more sophisticated defenses you have running, the weaker malware you get. Because if they are very rare ODAs, which they just discovered and which are very useful, they will not use them on security-minded people because they're worried that those will be discovered. But so they have quite some intelligence to decide what they put where. Okay? So this is one of the ways, but they have many ways. In fact, if you use a network, the internet, you're actually talking to the NSA. They take, they've taken over the network as much as they can and they control everything they can by injecting packets at the right places and controlling some key points of the network. For people in, in cryptography, this is not so surprising because um, in the early 80s, um, when people designed protocols, there is a very famous paper called Dolev Yao paper introducing the Dolev Yao model, which essentially is this, that if you speak to a network, it's in fact the opponent. So we used to this, but for us it was kind of an imaginative game in which, you know, this is what you would do to imagine our system to be secure, but nobody actually ever thought that this would be really happening, but it's happening. Okay, so in fact, even academic scientists are surprised that the model which is in their textbooks actually is being used. And of course, in our textbooks, the attacker only stays on the network, it would not try to attack your system. In crypto, in protocol world, the attacker only does the network, he doesn't do the network and the system. Okay. So, the malware is based on new zero days, but there is much more sophisticated things they do as well, like supply chain subversion, which is inserting devices while they're being shipped from the vendor to the end user, um, and so on and so on. You'll see more about this, I'll get more details, but essentially they try to control both the network and the device. Okay? So this is the summary in one sentence, complete control of networks and systems, and also they have a lot of techniques to bridge air gaps. So think of the Iran case, Stuxnet, um, the centrifuges, I guess people would have thought we are safe here because none of these devices on the internet, well, all kind of malware is being used to actually jump this air gap. And if your systems are air gap, they become a very interesting target. And so many techniques also for this. Very important, is it's no longer deniable. Um, well, there is a very different approach between US and UK. So in the US, in the first months of June, the US government started denying the things. But then every time they denied something, more documents came out to show that, in fact, what, what, to, to further prove, give evidence to the statements. And the British have a different approach. They always produce the same press release, which say that everything they do is necessary and proportionate and within the boundaries of the law. No matter what, for example, it was revealed that GCHQ had been looking at hundreds of thousands of people in front of their webcam. And some people actually at CCSQ needed psychological treatment because it was really painful to watch all those naked people. But so, even after that revelation, they say, everything we do is necessary and proportionate and within the boundaries of the law, okay? So I met a guy at CCSQ and I said, maybe you should make a new press release, it's getting boring. But he was not amused by my joke. And we also see that the oversight is very weak. So, in the US, you have these FISA courts. Um, 
So there is actually a court at the NSA where if they want to do certain wiretapping, which is, is, I mean, it's getting very complicated. I will not go into all the legal regimes and why they can do wiretapping and so on. But for certain wiretaps, they need approval. There is a court there. They go and put in a request. There is no defense side. There is only an, a DA side, the public prosecutor, who asks for access. And guess what? The access is almost always granted. There is only a few cases where the access has not been granted. So it's more like a rubber stamping court. In the UK, there is an oversight office, but so far they've not done very much. And there have been some cases in GCHQ, and in general, the attitude is if a court says GCHQ goes too far, then the government the next day changes the law. That's more as a philosophy, to, to keep it legal what they've been doing before. So I will not show you too many Snowden slides. I can recommend that if you have a lot of time that you go through them, but it's really very complex because, of course, all these things use keywords like TS is the abbreviation of top secret. And so what you learn also is that the NSA, uh, GCHQ, they love code words. So this means that if you just look at the slide, you may not understand much. For example, this is they call quantum theory, nothing to do with quantum physics or quantum computers. It's just a code word of the NSA for their active attacks and active defense. Okay, and so they have systems like tur turmoil, turbine, TAO, we'll revisit the TAO. But what you should remember from this slide is the following. Propagation delay from tip to target determines the success rate of the network effect. Less latency is more success. So they want to be as fast as possible. So you actually um, <coughs> would not, it would be faster than Google or Facebook or whoever else. By the way, I've been, it's just interesting that this thing, which is simple to understand, anybody understands the internet understands why it can work. Okay, but in fact, this was revealed, I think, November 2013. And by that time, people were separated. So most technical people have not even seen this. They kind of, whatever, they, they kind of got separated by all the press releases and all the news. Um, also, when I give this talk, for example, I gave it to the Dutch internet providers a couple of weeks ago. They said, we could actually detect this. And also, of course, on your device, you could detect this because a, a bit later, Google will answer to you. And so in fact, it could be not so difficult to defeat this. So, and I think for this reason, probably they're already shying away from this technique because it's, it's not deniable, it can be detected, and they probably have other ways of doing it. Okay. So some interesting slides you can also find is intensity of surveillance. Not so surprising that, for example, Afghanistan and Pakistan are very high. Also a bit surprising is, for example, that Germany is being surveilled much more than Belgium, even if Belgium has the headquarter of NATO and EU. Um, so maybe we can now sleep better by seeing this. Okay. So here is some other data. So this is Germany with also similar graphs from Spain and the Netherlands. What it shows is um, interception per day. And there is DNI, which is the blue thing, and DNR is um, the green thing. So DNI is the content of communication, and DNR is dial number recognition. So DN, DNI is dial number information, it's the content, and DNR is dial number recognition. So this is the number. So you think of telephone times, the number you dialed is being recorded. Of course, on the internet, it doesn't mean anything anymore. It's the metadata, okay? So who's talking to whom? Where is your device? Which website you're visiting? And so on and so on. So this is kind of the metadata. And so you see that the data collected in Germany over a given month um, is the number of items in both cases is around 10 to 20 million per day. Okay, this is not just a, a few terrorists being watched in Germany. This is massive population level, population-wide surveillance. Okay, so next thing is a very interesting and complex slide which I, I borrowed from George Danesis. I think he did a very interesting study on what's happening inside their architecture, which you can also learn from the Snowden revelations. So what you get on top is turbulence, which is the raw intercepts. And the raw intercepts they have, it's also not silos as we thought it was. It's actually a very strong integration. So of course they have satellites. So we'll see they have also cable, okay? But they also have spies, human intelligence. They have all kinds of stuff they have, Tao, Tailored access operations, this is specific spying on specific targets using special hardware and so on. And all those things end up hundreds of sources in large databases. And on the UK side, this is called turbulence. I think on the US side, it's called X-Keyscore. I'm, I'm not an expert in all those names, but I mean, they have a code word for this. 
but essentially um, everything is being connected. Another term for this is boundless informant. So they actually hook up everything they have. Okay. So how we thought intelligence works is the picture on the left. So what you have is selectors. You will find for people, um, say, who use the, the words Osama bin Laden, or nuclear, or Iran, or whatever, you use certain words which make you suspicious. And then if in a conversation or in whatever uh, this shows up, you actually promote this traffic, so you will send it to the analyst for further processing. This is how we thought this worked. In fact, what we see is much more sophisticated. And so this is called tempera um, at GCHQ. The Americans have a similar system called X key score. What, it, what you do is, in fact, you don't just look at traffic and select what's important, you store everything. Okay, well, everything is a bit exaggerated. It's only 20% because they do filter the videos of the cats. There is no reason to keep those. So they have some very um, simple boxes that filter for the basic stuff nobody wants to know, all the pirated movies and so on. They detect this and they discard this. Um, so what they keep is a ring buffer with all the traffic. So this is, if you do an estimate, it's like 125 petabytes, so a couple of hundred million dollars. And then they actually query it with metadata. So they try to get all the metadata out, which means analyze it and see who's sending to whom, what's being sent, and so on. What kind of content is this? And then they use kind of Google techniques, MapReduce, to actually process this and make this queryable. So that, in fact, just if you enter something in Google, you get very quickly an answer. They want the same thing. They don't want to search to 125 petabytes. They want to get the answer immediately. So it's, it's a kind of indexing technique. Okay. But what is more interesting is that then those queries are being used to create new selectors automatically. Okay, so this may sound very abstract, but my next slide gives you some examples. But so it's much more sophisticated than just saying everybody uses this term, or everybody calls this phone, we will actually promote the traffic. What I can do with the system is answer in real time, I have one phone number. Think of the Paris attacks or of the arrests in Verviers, they find a mobile phone. They can enter this phone in a temporal system. Immediately, they will get all the other devices of the same person. Okay, All their IP addresses, MAC addresses, locations, and everything. So you can be quite sure that as soon as such an attack is being detected, that the police services in Belgium or France connect to their friends in the UK or the US, give the phone number, and get all this information immediately. Okay. And the thing is, the problem is that neither the Belgians nor the French can actually do this by themselves. They don't have a big enough system, especially the Belgians not. Of course, the French will probably be trying to build the same thing, but the Belgians have no chance to do this. Okay. So assume you want to hack a country. You can put a query in Tempora saying, find all Microsoft Excel sheets containing MAC addresses in country X. So from this, you can derive all networks and how they're together because system administrators tend to collect their MAC addresses in um, Excel sheets or find all exploitable machines in country Y. So if you try to install a patch and it fails, on a Windows box there is an error message going to Microsoft. This error message also goes to the NSA. They intercept those and so they know which Windows boxes have failed updates and thus open holes which have not been patched. Okay, and with one query, they can find all those and then go after this. Or they can find everybody in a certain country speaking in Germany and using an encryption tool in German. Okay, so speaking in a certain language. So in fact, it's much more powerful than we think. And so when the NSA people testify in front of Congress, what they say is, we don't collect data on everybody because they have redefined collection. They say, we only, collection means that somebody gets data in a database and a human looks at it. But in fact, in Tempora, there is no human looking at it. So the queries they ask, they say, we only query some data, so we don't, what we collect is only this, and this is limited. Okay? But of course, this is a, this is a lawyer's definition. What, what is collect? I mean, for me, collection is having it in your database. But for the NSA, collection is a human looks at it. So this is, they say, this is actually quite limited. But I mean, it's a lawyer's game. I think in practice, I find this kind of horrific that these, these questions, the fact that you can answer those questions, you can see it's very, very intrusive um, and very, very powerful technique. Okay, 
So where do they get their data? Well, I attended a talk 22 years ago by the late Robert Morris. Robert Morris was the head of um, crypto agency at the NSA, and his son was actually the author of the Infinite Worm. Okay. And so he gave a talk. Um, and his talk actually was very interesting. I should have recorded it secretly and then listened to it 20 times because I think afterwards I, he told us a lot of things which we didn't know he was telling us. And so one thing he told us is rule number one of cryptanalysis, look for plain text. Okay, most traffic is not encrypted. So in fact, just collect plain text. Where do you collect plain text? Well, of course, we know that the NSA is listening to fiber, to underground cables, to satellite communication, and so on. What we learned as one of the first known revelations is that there is also the PRISM program where the NSA goes to Microsoft, Google, Yahoo, Facebook, Apple, and so on, and they get the plain text there. Okay, so the next slide is actually very interesting because it speaks about upstream. So upstream is the collection of communications. It speaks about PRISM and it says you should use both. So don't only look at the communication, don't only look at the servers. In your task, you have to use both pieces of information. So very clear instructions to the analysts. So Google was very upset when this slide was revealed. This very famous slide shows how the users neatly use SSL and how the newspapers start complaining about use of RC4 by certain Belgian banks and so on. But what actually happened until recently is at the Google front end, everything was sent to the back office and there was a back office for docs, for maps and whatever. And all those things were in clear. And so this is the smiley especially made Google very upset. So, of course, the NSA cannot eavesdrop on American soil in principle. So they asked GCHQ to do this. And so it, from the Snowden documents, we know that the network supplier of Google called Level 3 had a code word called little. And to quote Bruce Schneier, if your network operator has an NSA or GCHQ code word, you're screwed. OK, so the NSA was tapping this in clear. So this was this is the first way they could actually get access to this is by intercepting the communication between the back offices. Apparently, this is now fixed. Google started encrypting this as soon as I saw this slide. The second way, of course, is PRISM. The NSA can just come and ask for the data. Nobody has formally denied this. The only thing we don't know is what the exact interface is. So is this really real time? If you send a Gmail, that is, if, and if you're a target, this mail goes to the NSA, or does NSA come once a day and does some queries? Or we don't know. We don't know how the interface works, and nobody will tell us until more documents would arrive. The third way they could get better Google data is, of course, that it's quite likely. I don't have proof, but it's kind of very plausible that um, the NSA has Google SSL key. And Google was using RSA, which meant if you had this one single key, you could decrypt all communication on the left between your browser and the Google front end. That's the three ways I promised you. That's the three ways we know about. Okay, and so as far as I know, um, two have been stopped, but the PRISM program is still active. And there may be now other ways, because NSA is not just sitting there and doing nothing. This is a map of cables over the world. So you see that there is um, quite some cables. There is quite some details about this. I only show this for the data of GCHQ to give you an idea six years ago. So GCHQ was planning a tap of 17 terabits per second and selecting about four terabits per second. So this is the filtering of the videos of the cat. So 20% would be capped. OK, so this is an example. Um, it's also known already for a long time that the NSA has a special submarine to go tap undersea cables to install and, and manage those taps. OK, so this is not something new. By the way, the interception of communication, I didn't put in the slide, but in 2006, it was revealed by a technician of AT&T, who actually then left after his retirement, said in San Francisco, there is a room. And in this room, all the traffic of the West Coast comes together of AT&T, and there is an NSA tap. And there is an egress filter that actually selects 20% of traffic, and then all the rest goes to the NSA. And this was in the press in 2006, but kind of nobody paid attention to it. So it's not that we had needed Snowden to tell us all this stuff, um, but of course, Snowden brought so many documents that he could really capture the attention of the public. So now the metadata. I will explain to you what metadata is. So metadata is things like who's talking to whom, which websites do you visit, um, 
where is your phone, which kind of phone do you have, and so on and so on. So it's very interesting information. I mean, in fact, in most cases, in many investigations, you don't need what people are saying. You just need uh, the metadata to map out the network. You need to, for suspects, you need to find out who the other people are. And then probably based on that, you can get one of those talking or one of them is sloppy and then you can actually um, get to them. Okay, so one of the first known revelations was next to PRISM was that the NSA is collecting metadata on millions of Verizon customers in the US every day. And this is the reason why in the US people are upset with the NSA. Because the job of the NSA is to spy on everybody. It's their job, except for Americans, okay, or people residing on US soil. So if you actually go to the US for a while, you're protected against the NSA, or you should be protected against the NSA. Unless, of course, you have a special order attached to you. So, but the Americans were really upset about this because it clearly showed that NSA was overstepping its legal bounds. But the Americans are not upset that the NSA is doing its job so well. They're actually very satisfied with this. Also, the British are very satisfied. The CSQ is doing, I mean, they give value for money. They were told to spy on everybody. Well, they do it, and very thoroughly and in detail. But of course, they're not supposed to do it on their own citizens. But I also showed you with the Google case, of course, the CSQ can spy on Americans, and then they can spy on Brits, and then they have the data anyway. I mean, that's how they kind of avoid your, this protection. Now, the Europeans were kind of responding to this very loudly. But then in Europe, we have our nice parliament voting nine years ago the European Data Retention Directive, which actually forces operators to store all this traffic data. So the Europeans actually have a law saying that you should collect this data. So there is no reason to be upset about the NSA doing this to Americans. In fact, we do the same thing. Um, and there's some very interesting legal development about a year ago, European Court of Justice um, received a complaint and made a decision and said this is disproportionate because the idea is that you store data on everybody just to find a few guilty people. And this is actually against the Charter of Fundamental Rights in Europe, in particular against the principle of privacy. The state cannot collect everything about everybody just in case they have to investigate some crime case or some terrorism case. Okay, so this is actually very uplifting. Um, of course, it was only a case by one country, I believe, the Ireland, I'm not so sure. And uh, the lawyers are now discussing what the implications are of this verdict, whether it means something for Belgium, say. And as a Belgium operator, whether you now should collect the data following the data retention directive, or whether you should stop doing it following this court. And this is for the lawyers to figure out. Um, in the UK, they have a different approach. In the UK, the, U the UK government has immediately in June voted a new law saying this was legal anyway. Okay, so there, there is no doubt about it, it is legal. The hell with the European courts. Okay, so this is one of the things which was revealed. So the NSA collects about 5 billion mobile phone records a day. You know how GSM works with cells, and you're all smart people. So they, they call this program Code Traveler, because if you actually have all the cell data of every phone, you can actually find out who's traveling in the same car or the same train, or who's actually visiting whom just by doing correlations. After a while, there is only a few people who happen to be together with each other. So this is how you can map networks. You may also know that Obama did one concession. So he actually had a bunch of wise people write a report and they made some decent recommendations and they were all being ignored so far as I know. But one concession he made, which is the friends of the friends of the friends was stopped. So what does it mean? So there must be somewhere a list of bad guys 100,000, 200,000, whatever. All their friends are being monitored, and also all their friends, and also their friends. So Obama stopped the outer friends. So Obama said, we'll stop at friends of friends. I have bad news. I have very bad friends. You're now in the same room as me for a while. My phone is here. Your phone is here. Welcome to the club. I should have warned you, but it's too late, right? I mean, it's only friends of friends. It's not so bad, right? It's not so bad. So, hasn't it been shown that there's only at most two or three links between... No, it's six. The degree of separation between any two people in the world is six. But I, I think also probably the definition of friends is kind of um, hopefully a little bit restricted and maybe in the same room for one hour is not, is not enough because I think if you take for me the people who have been in the same room with me for an hour, 
I mean, this can be easily 10,000 or 20,000 people a year. So the damning data would go very fast. So they probably have some definition of having explicit communication or something, or I don't know. I don't know how it works. But in any case, if you start thinking about this, you never know, even if Obama says we'll do this or that, you don't know what it means in practice, right? They still don't say how many people they're now monitoring. Whether it's 100,000, 10 million, or 100 million. And whether you should feel good if they go down from 2 billion to 100 million, is this really good? Or to 50 million? Does it really matter? If you're in this list, it's bad, right? I mean, that's the thing. So in the US, the debate was mostly about this Verizon metadata. So Obama gave a speech and said, it's only metadata. Don't worry, guys. We're not listening to your calls. It's only metadata. But then he was a bit unlucky because Hayden, um, the former NSA director, gave a talk and said, we kill people based on metadata. This is actually how the drones find their targets. And then, of course, this, if you read his speech in detail, um, you will see that a bit later he says, but that's not what we do with this metadata. I mean, the Verizon one, OK? So not for Americans, officially. OK, so we had the servers, the communication, and the metadata. So we now also have the client systems. So they do hack the client devices by using OADAYS, OK? Or maybe by doing updates. My suspicion is that once your machine gets updated, you may get malware or you may get vulnerabilities. I know that Microsoft, as a security measure, actually started giving everybody different patches. It's called software diversity. And a good reason for this is that if you have an exploit, it will not work on all devices. It's, of course, a difficult problem for maintenance or for checking errors afterwards. But you can see that it's very easy for any company to say, oh, you're in Belgium or you're having this MAC address or this IP address range, now you get this kind of patch. And maybe they patch one problem and they insert another problem, okay? By accident or deliberate, okay? So you saw the revelations on collecting webcam pictures, okay? You may also know that any mobile phone can be turned into a remote microphone. Did you know that? So if you met with spooks before, there were fixed phones, then there was a sign next to the phone saying, please unplug this phone before starting the meeting. Okay? And so I, don't, I try not to meet too much with spooks, but sometimes I have to. And so what you have today is, or what you had before is with mobile phones, so switching them off is not enough. Even if they're switched off, they can still be used as a microphone remotely. They can still be talked to and be instructed to be activated. So if spooks were meeting, they were using their phone and putting the battery next to it. Okay, but of course, if you have an iPhone, you can't take out a battery. So if you now read with spooks, they have an outside room where they, you can lock your phone in a box and then you can go into the meeting room. And then there is a sign saying, uh, we, will, we have detection of phone, mobile phone equipment here. Okay. I mean, I've always find it scary because, of course, they have, so, certainly they, they must have a way to get into this box and actually um, put some malware on my phone and then put it back, right? It's kind of really scary to leave your phone in the hands of those kind of people. Okay, so if you ever have to meet them, leave your phone at home, okay? So, at Christmas 2014, we got a great present from Der Spiegel. Um, tower program was revealed, tailored access operations. This is actually what the NSA should be doing. This is building special devices to insert into the phones or the laptops or the routers of bad guys so they can monitor those. So this is in sense good because it's not done at a billion scale or hundreds of million. You can only do this by the thousands because it costs money and you have to do a black bag job or you have to intercept the shipping thing or so on. You can't do this at a scale of millions. You can only do this at a scale of thousands, okay? So I can really recommend you read those things. It's kind of paradise for the hacker. So it's hundreds of devices. It's described what they do, how big they are, how much they cost, how many have been ordered, and so on. And so there is some really, really cool stuff there. OK? So it describes the things which are, for example, inserted in a Cisco or Juniper router so that, in fact, this thing phones home and sends back all its secrets or sensitive data to a certain place. Um, here's another thing which I find really cool. The picture is not very clear, but this is something called Rage Master, and Rage Master is inserted between your motherboard and your video, and it only collects the red line because it seems to be enough to see what you do. It's a very small device, um, which is inserted there. It's a passive device, so you will not detect it in terms of power consumption. If they want to use the device, they will shine with a radar beam from a distance up to 20 kilometers to your device, 
And I spoke to some radar experts, so the radar cannot extract information, but it can power the device. So they can actually switch it on this way and give it power. And then probably this device will broadcast the secret information, like in this case your screen content, to which will be picked up by another antenna sitting next to the radar. And the interesting thing is that this thing can work from 20 kilometers distance. The radar expert says, yes, probably in the Afghan desert, not in a city, because you need a kind of line of sight thing. And I asked him about the health effects of sitting on a laptop where somebody is shining, shine, shining a laser beam at, but he didn't want to comment on that. But I don't think it's healthy. Now, on the other hand, if you get this kind of a stinger rockets on your head, it's also not healthy. So I'm not sure whether it really matters that much afterwards. But there may be some collateral damage, right? If the guy in the apartment above you is being hit by this, you may actually be radiated with some really bad stuff. Spooky. OK, so lessons learned. Never underestimate a motivated, well-funded, and competent attacker. These guys know what they're doing, and they're very good. So this idea that they're just listening to everything and picking out the bad guys is very naive. They're actually hacking everything. Okay. What it means is pervasive collection. So you're also being collected, and your data is being collected, I mean, and you're being hacked. It's also not that they only hack the bad guys. Look at the Belgacom case. How did it start? They find system managers, and they send them a LinkedIn invitation. Then they hack their device, and from there they go on. So in fact, they find it legitimate, in particular, people in charge of security and system managers, they are legitimate targets for the NSA, because they may lead them to the real targets. So the fact that they only hack bad guys is a, the system managers are completely innocent. They've done nothing wrong, but they will be hacked anyway. OK? So of course, the emphasis is not so, so much on ComSec, communication, but on CompuSec. There is a lot of economics there. So it's clear that after these revelations, at least a dozen nations, if not a few dozen, will start developing the same things. They will, want to, they will also want a temporal architecture for their country. They will also want all these kind of things, interception of all this stuff, a boundless informant. They will want Tao and so on. Okay? So, but what's happening is, as, for example, as Belgium, you're too small to do this. You don't have the budget and you don't have enough data to intercept. So what happens, I don't have evidence for this, but I think I'm almost sure it's correct. So what Belgium does, it, it collects the metadata from its operators. It gives them to the NSA. In exchange, if Belgium has an incident, they can give a phone number and they get the temporary query results. So it's kind of a trade thing. The big guys win. They have economy of scale. And as a small player, you can either not play or give all your data and hope you get something good in, in, in exchange. And this is all governed probably by secret treaties or by no treaties, so it's in some sense illegal. But this is also why you don't hear any politician saying anything. Only Merkel said something, but then it was revealed that there were at least five nations hacking her phone. So it's not probably also next to the Americans and the UK, probably also the Russians, the Chinese, and then some other nation, okay, maybe the Polish or so. So Merkel had a secure phone, but she refused to use it because her iPhone was cooler. So I think is, as a head of state, is very irresponsible. Okay. So, and of course, organized crime will also start using this. They will also learn from this, and they will do. So. They will hear about quantum insertion. Hmm, we can try this too to infect devices, right? So botnets will start using quantum insertion, and so on, and so on. Okay. So we just, as Europeans, we need to think about how we're going to have our own industrial policy because if we're not in charge of our own IT, we're going to be slaves of this system. That's the only solution for us. OK, a bit more about the crypto now. So after a few months, there was the first revelation about crypto appearing in the New York Times. So it's saying the NSA is actually running a war on encryption. And if you look at their systems, you can see that they don't like encryption. And so Snowden also says this. And I think it's obvious that if you would use good encryption, in fact, you're well protected against those things. Well, your metadata may still be collected, but at least your data is not. Um, you're actually much better off when you use secure encryption. So, of course, if you want to work encryption, the simplest thing to do is you ask for the key. Okay? So we have never seen a security letter, because if you publish a security letter, you go to jail for a very long time. But so we have some suspicions that LavaBit, this was the email provider of Snowden, LavaBit actually was probably told to give up its key, and they decided to shut down the company. Okay? So also, the guys behind Silent Circle, they have a secure email product, and they ship it down overnight. They cannot tell me that they got a good letter, because if they do, they go to jail. But why do you do this otherwise? Right? Think at 1 plus 1, and you get 2. 
Okay, so and also the Google case, why did Google switch to Diffie-Hellman to make this RSA key useless? Okay, so there is some defenses against this, but in general, if you're dealing with a US company that somehow has access to master keys or has access to your keys, you can be almost sure that your key will end up, end up in the hands of GCHQ or your NSA. Okay. So don't put all your secrets in one key. Um, in this case, also, you would wonder why you want to have an email system where there is one central server which has a key. But of course, it's much easier to design than a complex key management scheme. So if you can't get the private key, replace the public key. We discussed this yesterday in the PKI session, that our, in fact, we don't need the NSA and GCHQ to mess up our PKI infrastructure, but we did mess it up anyway, and they help us messing it up further. They buy weaker PKI companies to be able to falsify certificates. So Google has a, uh, sorry, GCHQ has a database called Flying Pig in which they collect all kind of information about TLS, and they probably store also private uh, TLS keys, which they get in one way or another. Um, very interesting is Flame. So Flame actually is malware analyzed by, and the crypto part was analyzed by a cryptographer uh, two years ago. So Flame produces a fake MD5 certificate and uses new techniques to do this. So we know how to break MD5, but not in this way. And so this is not just an amateur doing this. This is Israel, US, or something like this behind this. So they actually also do cryptanalysis to forge certificates and to undermine PKI. So I, I spoke yesterday on the CA mess on the web. So there is a big mess and the NSA, GCHQ taking advantage of this, but of course many other nations as well. And as a community, I think we have to fix this because it's a gaping vulnerability and you could say, well, nobody cares. It's just about credit card numbers. Well, in fact, it's our whole infrastructure of security is based on it and become more and more reliable on it, on having secure channels. So I think we should fix this infrastructure. It's urgently needed that we get a better governance system. Okay, if you can't get the key, then undermine the random number generator. How are keys being designed in a system or generated? I'll speak about it a bit more this afternoon. But essentially, you collect some entropy, which can be mouse movements or a reverse bias diode or whatever. So you use physics, but also free memory and process counters and whatever. You try to collect everything which looks a little bit random. You hash this together into a special mechanism and it outputs keys. Okay, this is what you do. If you can undermine this, you actually know all the keys and you're in a great position. So we have now strong evidence that the NSA did this exactly. So in with the dual EC DRBG. So ISO started working on random number generation in the late 90s took a very long time, also ANSI. And after a while, four schemes crystallized, two symmetric key and one designed by NIST, one symmetric key designed by NSA and one public key designed by NSA. And the public key one is the EC one. So what happened is in ANSI, things move forward, but only a very few people have access to the documents because it's a banking club and only the banks have to, if the bank sent you there or allow you to go there, you're actually allowed in. Same thing in ISO, you have to be a member. So ISO got a complete document from ANSI and standardized it in a few years time. And nobody really paid attention. Um, I was on the committee, but I thought this was a very weird thing to do, to use public key for random number generation, because this scheme was about a thousand times slower than the three other ones. So I thought nobody with a little bit of intelligence would ever use it. It requires much more area and it's much more complex and much slower. Okay. But then it becomes more interesting because the problem is that if you want to force people to use this stuff, you have to have a validation program. And ANSI or ISO don't have this, but NIST has a validation program. So actually then the standard was sent to NIST for, to become a FIPS, and then you could have your implementation validated. But the problem is that NIST has to make things public and they're quite visible. So in fact, they published this draft and they got immediately lots of comments saying, this is really crappy, these random bits are not random, there is a bias in them. And you should you, you chop only two bytes, you should chop 20 bytes or, or, or 40 bytes from it. I mean, it's really, really bad. And what this do was nothing. They just continued as if nothing had happened. Very bizarre, okay? And then at crypto 2007, so two years later, there was a talk given by Ferguson, who was actually present in the ANSI committee uh, together with Dan Shumov, the mathematician, and they said, well, there is a backdoor in this standard, and I'll show you how it works. 
So we thought that, you know, the NIST people fly home and the next month they withdraw this standard. What did NIST do? Nothing. Bruce Schneier wrote an opinion in Wired, complained, and they sent him a letter and did nothing. So in fact, they kept the standard under pressure of the NSA because the NSA wanted this backdoor. Now, there was something NIST did. I'm a bit unfair to them. They actually, already in ANSI, they allowed to use different parameters. So in fact, the backdoor parameters are a P and a Q. I will come back to those. And so you could actually change P and Q if you didn't like the ones generated by the NSA. Of course, they didn't say they were generated by the NSA, but everybody knows they are. Okay? But then the appendix has the following. You have to generate P and Q properly to avoid using potentially weak points. The points specified in the appendix A should be used. So it's kind of forced the people to use um, the ones backdoored by the NSA. Okay? That was the advice you got from NIST. So undermining standards is part of the bull run program. So if an NSA person comes to a standardization meeting, they actually dare to undermine stuff. By the way, in, I think in one ITF um, group, one of the vice chairs is from NSA. And people have been trying to remove him, but in fact they don't succeed because some people keep defending him. Really bizarre, okay? So of course, as soon as these revelations came out, people started looking at, oh, but there was this backdoor thing which we thought NIST had removed, or it's not removed, or it's still there, and of course big uh, fuss remains, so immediately NIST issued a statement that they withdraw um, this standard. And so, towards the end of the game, of course, now NIST is badly tarnished. Because NIST is a supplier of trusted cryptographic standards. And so we now know that, in fact, if the NSA tells NIST to do something, then in fact they do it and they put backdoors in, the, or at least they allow it, that backdoors should be there. The next thing what NIST did was they appointed a committee of experts to look at what happened, and I was the only non-US person in this committee. And so we wrote a report, we were given very little time, but the report, I think NIST tries to correct what they did wrong, but it's very difficult to correct your reputation, right? So they gave us access to most of the documents they could, but it was very difficult because some of these documents are secret, so I still haven't seen everything, I believe, but at least they did their really very best to explain what happened. And what I found out was that if you wanted to use different P and Q, you would slow down your certification by at least a year. So I asked who asked for different PNQs to be certified, and they went to, and to all the bodies that certify for NIST, and in fact they couldn't find anybody, and everybody told them there was no procedure for it, and if you want a certificate you had to implement the PNQ as specified. And then you could add your own, but then nobody would know how to certify your product. And so in fact this is why nobody actually used a different PNQ, even if the standard allowed this as a kind of an excuse. Okay? So, but still we were kind of, okay, this is really bad and this shouldn't have done this, but nobody uses this, right? It's a thousand times slower than all the others. And then a month later, or a month or two later, Reuters revealed that actually, um, in 2003 already, the company RSA replaced the default random generator in BSAFE, their library, to dual EC. And that at the same time, the NSA gave a $10 million contract to RSA. You could call this bribery, maybe that's a bit too far, but at least so some people found out the hard way that they were using dual EC without knowing it because it was a default algorithm in uh, the BSafe library. Okay, so how does the attack work? I will not go too much into the mathematics, but it's, we don't need much mathematics actually. So it's all place elliptic curves and it's a bit weird arithmetic, but we don't need that. So you have a state, okay? And every time you update the state of this thing, so it will produce new outputs. And you do this by multiplying part of the state to the x-coordinate of the point with the number p. So this is all secret, okay? And then you num take the, the state and you multiply it by q. And this multiplication is an elliptic curve multiplication. It's not just uh, integers. So it's a bit weird. It's hard to invert. And then you truncate two bytes of the result. And this is what you output. And then what you do is you update the state with p again, and you multiply this again by q, and you truncate an update. So this is what you do. This is how you produce from a short secret. You produce longer secrets, which you can use to generate nonces and to generate keys. Okay? So now, what does the NSA know? The NSA knows the relation between p and q, and so it can actually go from the output. It can go to the state and then predict everything. So if the NSA sees one output, 
It has to guess two bytes, and then you can guess those and try the, the thing. You there know the secret parameter D, which is the relation between P and Q, and from this they can go back in the state and find this S2, and from then on they know everything you ever produce. So, very simple and very clever. Now, finding D from P and Q is very hard, but if you cho first choose P and D, you can compute Q. And this is what the NSA likely did. Okay. So very, very clever because it's a backdoor which the NSA can exploit, but the Chinese and the Russians cannot because they don't know the D. So how this happens in TLS, so in TLS, the first thing you do as a client is you send a nonce. This is in clear over the internet. Okay, the NSA intercepts this. From this, they can compute now your state, so they can compute your session key of TLS. So it's probably the fourth way of getting at Google data. If you use BSafe as your library, then they also can break TLS connections. Okay, so, and of course you now also see that if you would drop 20 bytes or 16 bytes, this attack would be much harder because you have to guess all of those. Okay, so this is why the NSA drops two bytes, but the problem is that if you drop only two bytes, there is some bias in this result as well. It's not completely random. So it was a really bold design, and I'm still thinking, how did they dare to do this? Right, because it was up, kind of obvious. So the NSA wrote a paper, published this in North American Mathematical Society, a few months ago, you can read this paper, and they said, well, we should maybe not have done this, but anyway, it's very hard to exploit this attack. No, it's not. There was a Usenix paper this summer um, by a large team showing how you can exploit this in real life. Uh, depending on the settings, it takes you a few seconds to a few hours on normal PCs, and the NSA has much more, to find the key. Okay. So... This kind of thing, this backdooring of crypto, is not new. In fact, in the late 90s, um, Adam Young was a PhD student of Moti Young, and they wrote a whole series of papers called um, Crypto Virology, or Kleptography, they called it, and then later on they made the name Crypto Virology, in which they show how you can backdoor crypto, and the main message is that if you didn't design your own crypto or your own library, you can always be tricked by the opponent. So if you want to use my library, I can always spoof you, and so this book has many ways of doing it, and one of them is exactly this kind of technique, a discrete log-based technique. So it's not a new invention. The MSA was actually inspired by this research. From actually the paper describing this is 1997. Okay, so in fact, we were warned, but we kind of ignored the warnings. Then fast forward to last Christmas. So last Christmas, there was again a big batch of documents released by the Spiegel. Um, in which it was shown that actually the NSA has a real-time decryption infrastructure. So if you're using IPsec, SSH, or TLS, um, it's not the case that they, well, it's, it's well known that they take encryption and store it long-term in case they can decrypt. But there is better news for them if they have the key already, they have a database of this, they can tell this and they can decrypt in real time and put your data with all the rest. So they don't have to first send it to Utah, decrypt it there and then it comes later, it goes in real time, they can decrypt faster than the recipient. And this is what's described in those documents. So, and it also says that, for example, some IPsec implementations have weak pre-master secrets, have implementation weaknesses. So, for example, the plan was that by end of 2011, they should be able to decrypt 20,000 secure VPN connections per hour, which means they had quite some capacity in this network. And you don't do this if you have quite some keys. Yeah, if you only know a handful of keys, you're not going to build something like this, right? It also means that for thousands and thousands of people, they know the keys. How? We don't know. Okay? This is really bad news. Um, there was a rumor also at Christmas that the NSA can break AES. It was based on this message. Um, electronic code books is the NSA name for block ciphers. Um, they still use antiquated terminology for some things. Um, such as the AES are both widely used and difficult to attack. This is the good news. And so NSA has only a handful of in-house techniques. This is also good. So we'd, we wonder whether they have techniques which we don't know. Maybe they do. Okay. The Tundra project investigated a potentially new technique, the Tau statistics, to determine whether it was useful to break block ciphers. Okay. This project was supported by blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, but people said, oh, the NSA knows how to break AES. Well, the only thing it says that the NSA had an idea for a new technique and it applies it to some block ciphers. It doesn't even say it applies it to AES. Okay, then if you look at the context, this actually came from a magazine published by the NSA, a top secret magazine, of course, um, which actually shows that Tundra was an undergrad student project. 
You really think if the NSA knows how to break a yes, they will ask an undergrad student who is visiting for the summer to do this? I mean, so this was, but in spite of this, um, in fact, some in the press picked this up and said the NSA can actually break a yes, yes. In, in defense, the, uh, the PC was an undergraduate student project. Yes, well, <laughs> that's true, but still. So there is also good news because some documents were leaked that show something like this. So no decrypt available for this OTR encrypted message. So in fact, if you use OTR of the record messaging, a system developed by Ian Goldberg, um, at least some things cannot be decrypted. That's the good news. Of course, we should also be aware that Snowden had no access to documents related to cryptanalysis. We can only indirectly from what we see guess what NSA can break, but maybe some things they can break and they don't want to tell others inside the organization. That is really, really secret, so we don't know. So maybe if it really matters, they can decrypt this anyway, but we have no indications for this. So I think the basic conclusion should be, uh, well, we probably have some, if you use good encryption, we're still okay. Okay, so what is listed as being hard in this latest revelations is TrueCrypt, but you know that TrueCrypt also was, the development was stopped. We still don't know why, but you can now guess. Okay, GPG, Tor, so the NSA cannot massively um, decrypt Tor, um, although the Tor researchers were very upset because there was a report from NSA saying, we tried technique so and so to break Tor, I mean, it didn't work very well. And the researchers were very upset because they wrote a year after much better results and the NSA hadn't even noticed them after 10 years. So the researchers were very disappointed about the incompetence of the NSA with respect to breaking Tor. So Tor was, is not designed to withstand the NSA, okay? Clearly there is no way if you want to withstand the NSA, you have to make a completely different system. Okay, so but what I could, the conclusions are that if you want to be secure against the NSA, you probably should use standard stuff like RSA, DV Hellman, Elliptic Curve, DV Hellman, AES. You should use open source stuff end to end. And then the really sad thing is that all those systems don't have a large user base. Because if you have a large user base, there probably will be also weak implementations and then they can exploit them. Okay, but at least I think there is some good news there. If you do your job well, um, you may have some hope. So, the NSA has been badly fighting crypto in many ways. So, undermining standards is one of them. Okay, also by the, they've been pushing DSA. And I will speak this afternoon about the problems of DSA signatures. And Sony can tell you everything about this. So, it's not a good signature scheme for most implementations. So, they go after the keys. They exploit weak implementations. This is my guess on how they can break this IPsec um, things. And also so the documents actually give some indications about this. And maybe they also break stuff, like we don't know. But I, I, for example, I would, the attack on RC4, I explained to you um, on Tuesday, I mean, I'm still hitting my head that I didn't find it because it's like 10 lines of code. I mean, it's the first thing you should do, but just nobody ever tried this. So I'm quite sure that it was the first thing NSA did, right? I mean, so. How else can you fight cryptography? You make sure that standards have 48 documents and 99 options. So then you will know that there are no secure implementations and nobody can check implementations and there is always some corner cases which are incorrect and so on. And so if the code is 100,000 lines, then you know that there is more bugs than if you have only 3,000 lines of code. Well, it's not a law, but it's kind of simple engineering. Okay. The old technique was export control. It's less used now, but still, it is still in use. You can't export everything. Probably hardware backdoors. Okay. And then what you also see, of course, is that you see sometimes a collaboration with the FBI. So probably the NSA is not very happy about encryption on Android and Google being more secure now. Then you let the FBI complain about all these child abduction cases that they can't solve and all these children that die in the hands of rural torturers because they actually are encrypted iPhones, right? So, Which actually to anything. of course not, but it just sounds good and the, the broader public buys this. Um, but I mean, so Cameron has making, been ex making extremely stupid statements saying that we should ban encryption and so on. I mean, he doesn't even understand that the whole internet would kind of come to a halt if you would ban encryption. Um, and we have a very bright minister of justice who just repeated Cameron more or less. Um, but at least Obama has said something sensible. I think he said a, a few weeks ago that encryption is needed, so encryption is needed. And that sometimes you have to pay the price. So he seems to be smarter than Cameron, which is, well, not a surprise, probably. 
So what are the implications? So, in fact, for crypto, we'll come back to the general research later, there's quite some crypto in use. I mean, when I started doing crypto in the late 80s, um, I think it took a long time before I saw a real crypto box. Of course, they were in use by governments, but they wouldn't come and let show them to you. I mean, you could see, of course, brochures of vendors. There was no web, right? Remember, there was no web in the 80s. So if you wanted to see a brochure, you had to go to a vendor or write a vendor. You get a brochure with a picture, but you would not see the real, real thing. And banks were using it. So there was the, I saw my first crypto boxes at banks. But of course, today, crypto is everywhere. So I found about, I think my guess is 30 billion crypto devices, which is quite a lot. So crypto is everywhere. But the biggest users are code updates and payments. Credit, debit, um, ATM, point of sale, and then also internet, e-commerce. Um, of course, this has been changing a little bit. After the stone revelations, Google, Facebook, and so on have been doing a better job at using more HTTPS. But before, it was mostly to send credit card numbers. Right? Nobody used TLS for anything else on the internet, maybe some e-health sites. But for the rest, TLS was actually quite limited. OK? We do need confidentiality. For example, government does need it. They need encryption, and there are big users of them. Okay. For DRM, of course, this is the biggest use of, or one of the big users of crypto is the DRM industry. And also, a lot of the crypto in our PCs and phones is used, or potentially used for DRM. I hope crypto will be used more in, for e-health. If you take today all the implantable devices, more and more, they are being implement, implanted with wireless controls. So with a remote control, you can adjust the heart rate or the insulin injection or whatever. And there is no security on those things. I hope that in the future there will be more. The telcos, encryption has become very cheap. Even in software, you can do it now and get a good speed. But we still have no end-to-end -end secure encryption offered by the telcos. And if I get a chance to speak to politicians, then I always ask them the question, how can it be that it is still legal to offer a telco service without encryption? I mean, if you offer a car without seat belts, you're kicked out of the market or without brakes. But you're allowed to offer telco services without encryption. How can this be legal? Of course, you all know what's happening. The governments want to get the content, and so they make sure, in fact, there is no encryption. And if it's there, it's not end-to-end -end, like in GSM, or it's backdoored, like in Skype. We actually have hard disk encryption. A large number of hard disks have hard disk encryption. Uh, you'll find this out if your hard disk ever fails. Because in the past, if your hard disk failed, you could go to one of those guys, and they would take your hard disk apart, and they would read out the disks and give you your data back for 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 euros. Today, these people are getting unemployed, not only because it's solid state, but even for the hard disks, because what they will find is a ciphertext. And where is the key? Well, the key is sitting in the controller. OK. But do you have security? No, because if you take this encrypted hard disk, you plug it out, and you plug it in another device, it still works. So there is no key management, or there is no password needed. For this, you have to pay extra. And so in fact, you have encryption on your hard disk, but no security. You only have disadvantages, which means you can't recover your data from the physical bits. But you don't have any protection, because anybody just plugs in the hard disk, and it works. OK, so we have hard encryption, which, which doesn't, somehow. OK, also in the cloud, even after Snowden, I don't think much of the cloud data is encrypted. So here are some numbers. This is symmetric key deployments. Um, there is green and blue. Green is encryption for confidentiality. Blue is authentication. OK, so there is about 6 billion mobile devices. I think the same number of access cards like those. Then you have banking cards, about 3 billion. Um, DRM, Blu-ray, DVD is 1.5 billion. Hard disk is about half billion. Pay TV is 300 million. Symmetric key, game consoles, and then access readers, something like this. So lots of crypto, about 20 billion devices. The only encryption symmetrically is mobile. It's not end-to-end. -end. It stops at the base station or base station controller. It's on the hard disk, but this is completely unusable. And this is Blu-ray. In fact, the user is the enemy, not the user of encryption. Public key. Okay. The biggest thing is 
updates on your device, three billion devices probably, maybe it's more, have secure update using public key. There is 2.7 billion EMV cards, credit card payments with public key. Um, <coughs> Two billion misses browsers, okay. Then 600 million pay TV devices, half a billion Skype users. Um, identity cards and passports is 200 million and so on. Um, there is actually 1 million Bitcoin public keys and 500 d keys for DNS. So this is all the smaller cases with maybe larger impact or larger media impact. But again, look at what is green, what gives you encryption. Um, the browser gives you encryption, but you know about all the problems with browsers. So it is really so good. And the other one is Skype. And we're not allowed to see the specs of Skype, not even the crypto specs. So I suspect there is a backdoor. So again, it's a very bleak picture. Because, in fact, we don't give the user end-to-end -end secure encryption. As a cryptography community, we've been failing miserably. Okay, the best we offer at a large scale is TLS. I don't have numbers for IPsec and SSH. I should do some research on this, but I don't think it will be in the billion. I think it will probably be more like tens of millions or hundreds of millions, but this is just the geeks and, and a few. Uh, but I think we, we actually, as a crypto community, we failed. Okay, so... Communication security, so what we learned is that if you do it right, it works. The standards are very complex, so we should probably profile them or maybe we should do more to replace them. I know that, for example, Dan Bonnet wrote a very nice paper a couple of years ago. Also, Dan Burstein has ideas how to simplify encryption and have one simple standard for network level encryption. But somehow these things don't get traction because the Cisco's and the Junipers don't jump on it and the Microsoft, so it's very difficult to build this up as academics. And people say, so what? Right? I mean, we have IPsec. So only a few percent of traffic is protected. These slides are, maybe I should update this. I think it's now increasing. If you probably take a random internet connection, probably given the fact that even Yahoo now encrypts, it's probably more like 20 or 30% is encrypted, okay? But still, I would maintain the second thing that of that only a very small part is securely encrypted, which means that the key is not in the hands of the bad guys or the algorithm is properly chosen and so on. Good. So there is weak legacy systems. Uh, there is not end-to-end -end systems. There is backdoor systems. There is the dual EC kind of thing, backdoors. There's a key management and so on and so on. So we have a big job there to do. The other thing is that in crypto classes, I always teach my students to move secrecy of data to a secrecy of one key. But if you think about this, it's really stupid because then the NSA comes and asks for this key. Okay, so at least you don't want a system-wide key. I'll speak about this also this afternoon. You don't want a system-wide secret or a system-wide database. But even if every user has one key, they will go after this using malware. Okay, so. Cryptographers have worked on this already for a long time. This is the, the basic techniques. The ideas are date to the, back to the late 80s, and the schemes date back to the late 90s, so the patents will expire soon. In fact, it is possible to, instead of putting all secrets in one key, to put your key in multiple places and have a key in your smartphone, one in your laptop, one in your smartwatch, uh, maybe one in RFID tag, which you put in your shoe. So divide your keys in many places, and then if you have to do a calculation, you somehow give them each part of the ciphertext, and they produce you a result, and from the end you can decrypt. But if somebody comes in and hacks your laptop and something else, they still can't get decrypt. So they really have to hack a majority of devices, or a large fraction of devices. And this would be robust security, where you could get one device from France, one from the Netherlands, one from the US, one from the UK, one from China, and so you can assume that those will not collaborate unless you're a really important target. So, of course, rolling this out is non-trivial. We've been working on this a long time ago already. We'd, even explaining this to users is quite tricky because it's really magic, right? And if you forget to put on the right shoes, it no longer works. So this is, so you really have to think about this. There's also patents in that area. There are several telcos with patents on that sort of local use keys. There is, but I mean, but at least the, the, some of the core research is mid 90s. Yeah. And so I'm hoping that those patents will expire quickly. But let's see. There's some quite recent patents. Yeah, of course. I mean, there's, but I mean, if you, you can build a system based on things that have been published in the 1995, right? You can use things in it. So, secure channels. Strange enough, people who are looking at TLS, I showed you the, in the TLS lecture all these red arrows, all these problems with TLS. 
And part of it has come that we still don't understand what a secure channel is. You would think, wow, thousands of researchers, four decades of open research, we still know what a secure channel is. Well, it's a hard problem. Fragmentation, defragmentation, compression, um, negotiating your key. How do you do this? I mean, what, with which algorithms do you negotiate your key? How can you still prove security? Um, what about constant time decryption? If you look at all the aspects, we're still barely understanding what is needed. Okay? So we should switch to Diffie Hellman. I, I explained this in the lecture on authentication and authentication that you should not use RSA because for key transport because then the NSA asks for your key. You should use Diffie Hellman and then what you have is a signing key as long term key. This is much less damaging. So if you really want to make a more robust network, you should start looking at a higher level, look at DNS. Of course, we have DNSSEC, but it has problems and it is not widely used. You have routing problems. A couple of years ago, the Chinese sent out wrong writing updates and suddenly a large part of internet traffic went to China. Of course, they couldn't handle it and they said, oh, sorry, we made a mistake, but it's very easy for any nation to get all the traffic to them or selected traffic to them. So we have to secure BGP. There is long term work on this, but all those things require big investments and it doesn't seem to be high on the political agenda or on the commercial agenda. So we really would have to have all those things be secure by default. That would be the only solution. For metadata, we are in big problems. There is one system that requires quite some attention. I think it's a very nice design. Tor, anybody using Tor here? Okay, quite some criminals in the room. <laughs> but so, it's actually interesting because it's the only real life system um, I trust the people behind it, but you should be aware that Tor is for a large part funded by the U.S. defense. Okay, it's also used by spooks to stay anonymous. Um, but it's also clear that Tor does not protect you against the NSA. I mean, it's kind of, it was surprising to us that the NSA documents in 2007, 2008 say that they can't break Tor on a large scale. They, do, they can find individuals, selected people, but they can't do it massively for everybody. But still, a lot of research is needed. Also very interesting, um, this is, you should watch the lectures by Roger Dingeldine, for example, the one he gave at the CCC in Hamburg last December. Tor is now more about censorship resistance. And in fact, there is interesting connections between surveillance and censorship. And the technologies for one can be used for the other. Um, it's very interesting how the connections are there. For example, the battle of Tor with the Chinese government, the Chinese government doesn't want to identify users, the Chinese government wants to shut down Tor or make it unusable in China. So they want to censor it. Location privacy, we don't have a good answer. I mean, there is solutions, but little deployment. So about computers, if data is at rest, well, just encrypt it, okay? But of course, what to use? Maybe BitLocker has a backdoor, right? I mean, are we sure or not? TrueCrypt has stopped, so is there an alternative? Easy to use, convenient, with a backup of keys, maybe keys shared over multiple devices, or you give five of your friends a share, so if you're in trouble, um, you can tell them to destroy it, or you can give it back to you, whatever. Um, in the cloud, the problem, of course, is key management. You, everybody can encrypt, but what to do with the keys then? And there is now quite some cloud companies that say, we'll encrypt your data and we'll also keep your key. But then you can as well not do it, right? I mean, okay. So and then you can compute on stuff, in the computing security world, um, of course, we have many errors. I mean, the highest visible error was Heartbleed, although some people claim it was not the biggest problem for TLS, but it just had a good logo and it, did, it was easy to explain. Um, but you have the update problem, which I explained to you can be used to undermine your individual devices. If your updates come from country X, country X can screw you, okay? Our defenses are not very strong. There is human factor, like we didn't think of this, that you know, the NSA would give $10 million to a company to undermine their software, or that you could a security letter to actually give up your keys. We never thought about this stuff. So we have to live in a world where those things happen. Also supply chain, uh, we didn't think about, that people would actually undermine this. So there is no silver bullet here, but I think the first rule is simplify, simplify, simplify. 
everything which is complex, you have an army of hundreds of hackers at the NSA. Who is going to win? You with your tiger team of three people and one week time, or the NSA with dedicated hundreds of people? Um, you're going to lose. Okay? If your system is simple, you have a chance. If your system is complex, you will lose. Local computation. We should actually make sure, and there is some very promising research to make our processes more secure. There is a whole list, uh, list of teams working on this. In our university, work on this, but also Cambridge, there is US universities. There is also Intel is working on this. So how to make durable computers so they actually have security features like secure memory, key storage, separation, really cryptographically based separation, not separation which you can uh, circumvent by one stupid bug. So rethink stuff. Here is some, some things you may want to look at. TPM, Smart, Sankus, SGX, Flickr, there is many more. So we still don't see this at a massive scale, except for SGX, which is the Intel solution. Um, also, you can keep data local. You can do computations on data locally and prove to the other party you were honest. This is remote attestation, more or less, but at least for privacy, it's very good. And your data doesn't leave your device. Okay? I still don't understand why we need the cloud. I mean, of course, we can do great things, but this device is much more powerful than the mainframe from the 70s and 80s. So why can I not process my data like advertising? I mean, this device is smart enough to figure out which advertisements I want to see. My data doesn't need to go to Google to figure that out. And could actually say which advertisement I want to see. And maybe let me even influence this choice. So we are actually, uh, our architecture is completely wrong, right? I mean, the fact that put everything there, it suits the Googles and the Facebooks, and it suits the intelligence agencies. But it doesn't suit us. Okay? It makes them money, so their business model, as long as they, this business model is legal, we actually have a problem. Yeah. So I think what the EU should do is make the business model of the Googles and the Facebook illegal. But of course, they don't have the guts for this. One, and second, they actually take advantage of it as well, our politicians. So we need new politicians. I mean, I don't want to advertise parties, but I mean, I've been speaking a lot to the Greens um, and the Pirate Party in the European Parliament, and they're very smart people. They understand the issues. And I mean, there is not that you can say there is no politicians who don't who understand this and who can solve this. But of course, they get only 5% of the vote or 3% of the vote. That's the problem. But I think we, it's not enough for us to say there is no solution. Well, there is something you can do. You can help design those stuff. You can talk to those politicians, and you can maybe vote for them, whatever. I mean, everybody makes their own choice, but. You can't say that nobody is understanding this. We need open solutions. You see in this whole climate, if standards are closed, systems are closed, there will always be backdoors. And open source is not a miracle. Heartbleed was open source. Shellshock was open source. But at least you have a chance to detect it. We could have found it earlier if we only had spent more time. And at least we can check the fixes ourselves. And we know, know for sure, but otherwise you get a patch and maybe you actually close that door and open a new one. Okay? should look at every stage. So in the design, you have cryptography. Here is the famous picture from Cisco routers, which are actually being, the packages are being opened. A special tower chip is being added and the router is shipped on. So I now know some companies who sent their own staff to pick up equipment at certain vendors because they don't want to have their stuff shipped anymore because they don't trust the shipping process. Okay, so, but, of course, that's not the best solution. Can we actually do this in a more cost-effective way? Can we actually make sure that the device which was shipped by a vendor ends up, I mean, you could do a 3D scan or something and, and authenticate this somehow. I mean, you should have clever solutions for those things. We should work on it. We now understand the problem. Can we solve it? Okay, so it has to be through the whole lifetime. So I already gave a hint about this. Architecture is politics. So we have evolved to this internet business model where you collect data about people and you monetize this to advertisements. So Google makes about $10, $15 per person a year on advertisement. Facebook is maybe a bit less, but this is the, the order of magnitude. I mean, I would be happily pay Google $10 a year if they would stop collecting data on me. And even if you look at all your services, I would be happily pay a fee of $100 per year, which would make it then illegal or impossible to collect data on me. But of course, changing an existing business model is very difficult. I mean, Google collects 50 billion, it tells such a company not to do it, well, they're gonna get very big opposition. And of course, they will say, oh, if you switch this, if you disallow us this, then our services will stop, and no politician dares to do this, right? 
But somehow we're led to believe that this is the only way you can do this. But this is not true. You could actually do many of those things centrally. And I mean, for some services, you have to have the data, like Google flu, right? But do we, is that really the most important thing? And you can also find out with the flu with other means, right? I mean, you could, and you could also do this by sending a, a small string to a site anonymously where then some analysis is being done. I mean, there is no way that you need all this data to do this. What you have to do is rethink the architecture, make a completely new one where we start from scratch, from the hardware up, everything open source, and all the data stays local. If we do computations, we do it locally with remote attestations, so we prove it's correct. And if we put things in a database, we encrypt it and we operate on encrypted data. So this is a, a kind of dream vision of academics. But I think if I don't work on this, who will? And if you don't work on this, who will? Maybe it should be a good hobby to start working on this. Because, you know, of course, it's easier to play in the app economy and make money out of this stealing data. And, but in fact, you're becoming guilty to the whole thing, right? So you need to go back to principles. Minimal disclosure. Your data should stay with you under your control. Okay? So you don't need to collect all this data. If you collect it, you collect it in encrypted form or completely anonymized and very much stripped down. Okay? And if you do it locally, you also can do it cryptographically protected so that you can prove that you're not manipulated. So I think there is also cases, for example, games where you want to prove you have not hacked the game. But this can be done with crypto. So I'm not the kind of person who says crypto can do everything, but we can first start using crypto for communication security, as it should be, and for properly encrypting stuff. And once we've done this, which will take several years, we can start working on this, having a new architecture where people stay in control and owner of their own data. Okay? So of course, there is still quite some work. So first, we have to fix network security, but then the real problem is the end systems. We should rethink our architectures. We should rethink our threat models. Okay, you think that only the US will intercept US, intercept routers? Some other nations will start doing the same thing. Okay, organized crime. We need open technologies and review by open communities. So pervasive surveillance, and now I'm becoming a bit political again. It's not just listening, it's hacking everything. And also it has quite a nefast influence on society. If you know you're under surveillance, you will not act the same. And surveillance tries to actually find outliers. Now, if you look at our society, how we have new ideas, how its progress is made is because there is outliers, original people who come up with new ideas and said this business model we have is completely nuts. We should do things completely differently. Now, if you design an architecture in which outliers are isolated and put apart and discriminated against and targeted by surveillance, you actually, or if you kind of try to suppress it or to try to say people, if you try to do things differently, you will be monitored and you will not get an insurance anymore or you will have problems with your health care and whatever, then you will actually encourage conformance. Okay, so surveillance, massive surveillance is much worse than just, oh, I have nothing to hide, it's okay. No, no, it actually will ruin our society in the long run. In some sense, I mean, if you think about it, what we are creating is something like Stasi. And everybody agreed 20 years ago Stasi was bad or 30 years ago, but today we're actually building it ourselves. Okay, so on the other thing is what we have today, Georgia Nesis calls cyber colonialism. So as European nations, we're colonized by the US and the UK because they run the IT infrastructure, they run the devices and they decide what the rules are. They decide um, well, how much of a breastfeeding woman you can show on this website and they decide who's been eavesdropped, who has secure communication, who has not, and so on. So in fact, we're no longer in charge of our own destiny as a nation. Also economically, they can spy on the companies, steal, steal the know-how and create their own companies that start competing. So we should not be naive there, right? It's not only just, you know, make their norms and values, it's actually the economic values. Okay, so we have to have an industrial policy in Europe. And I'm not sure we can do this with the UK, but let's see. And also, of course, when we do this, I mean, I want to, I don't have many friends in law enforcement, but also they need to get reasonable options, okay? So if you tell them, we're going to encrypt everything and you go to hell, that's also not good. But at this moment, I'm not very inclined to say, oh, we'll put a backdoor in for you because we know that to the same backdoor, of course, um, the government's surveillance systems will go through as well. So we have to think about this. Can we make a system which stops mass surveillance, which switches back to targeted surveillance, but which still has some options for law enforcement as well? 
a lot of things to think about during your coffee break. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm of course happy to take questions so, online or offline, yes. Um, I think the security link has introduced an interesting new problem because if, uh, if you want to attack an organization, you can plan to be the answer and present them with the security data. Yes. And then, then Indeed. I guess probably the companies, they will call somebody to authenticate this, right? I mean, but indeed, yes, it's a problem. You could try this and it could work in a nation, yes. But I think it's, it's a more fundamental problem because it's, again, it's like secret courts, secret letters, secret designs, secret backdoors. I mean, a society with too much secrets, you can't control the power anymore. And we've, we've developed this system over... Uh, uh, hundreds of years with the balance of power, the judicial system, the executive system, and the parliament. And if you start putting secrecy in there, you will, you will actually uh, distort the balance. I think this is something which is very important. I think this is hurting your interest, because if you want to offer cloud services, you have no assurance on what's happening with your data. Exactly. And um, I'm curious to hear your uh, opinion on techniques like homomorphic encryption and whether like there's promise. Yeah, so... <laughs> Homophic encryption is easy. Homophic encryption means that you have two plain texts and you can add or multiply them by adding or multiplying the cipher text. Okay, this is fantastic. So you can, for example, compute the average of plain texts while they're still cipher text. So you can compute the average, but then you have the encrypted average. Now, there was a breakthrough five years ago at IBM, or in fact at Stanford and IBM. The guy was PhD in Stanford, is now at IBM, by Craig Sentry. He actually showed that it's possible to also do add and multiply on the same data. This was a very long open problem. It's known as fully homomorphic encryption. You can do both add and multiply. Before we could only do one of the two, but not both. And so IBM, of course, put out a press release and said, we can now do everything in the encrypted domain. Okay, it's fantastic. Of course, to store one bit, you need 20 million bits. And to do one addition, you need a few days of two bits. Now there have been quite some optimizations, so now it's only 100,000 bits and only two hours or so, or two minutes. But I mean, it's, so first it's still in that respect science fiction, but we got a big EU project where we do somewhat fully homomorphic encryption. If you say you can do multiplications, but only a few, but as many additions as you want or vice versa, then you can actually get better performance. So it can be very cool, but it still is a problem in the sense that, okay, you have this database which is encrypted, okay? It's, say it has your data, so the database can now compute for you the average or can the risk for a certain disease or whatever, but now the answer is encrypted with your key. So you can decrypt and get the answer. But of course, Google is not happy because they can't decrypt it. So it only serves, solves certain use cases. It cannot be helped, for example, it cannot be used to decide which advertisement to show you because the, the result is also encrypted. And if you have the key centrally, well, then you don't need to do all this stuff. Then you can just decrypt all the data, do the operations and re-encrypt, right? So it only makes sense in which, a case in which you have the decryption key, then you have to do, your data is in the cloud, they operate on it, you get the result, you give it back and you decrypt. And one example is, is um, Microsoft showed, is you show some health parameters like your pulse and whatever, your blood pressure, and they compute your risk for a heart attack. And so everything is encrypted, so they don't know your data. They can maybe hide their algorithm, let's say know how. You don't know how they compute it, but you give a number back which makes you feel good or bad. So that's, a, that's good. But in general, there is not many use cases for this. It's very, very cool. But if you think about it, it's not really the biggest use case. There is more use cases for multi-party computation, where you have some data, somebody else has some data, and you compute together on it. And the outcome, everybody can see. For example, you have two databases, like this has been done in Estonia recently. And the law by law, they cannot be shared. What you do is you do computations in a trusted server, it never sees the data, so it's not really trusted. It only has to do the correct things. What comes out is the intersection of the databases. But nobody can look at individual records. Only the one people who actually have been in two databases are the people who uh, claim to be unemployed and sick at the same time or whatever, who kind of benefit from two sites. You can find them out without actually ever merging the databases. So this is called multi-party computation. It's much more powerful and much more useful. But FHE has been hyped and it's such a cool thing. So I think it's very dangerous because it's been oversold. Because first, it's not practical, and second, it does some very interesting things, but not many. And I think that's... Doesn't it offer them uh, a lot of possibilities uh, in, in service models, for example, in the cloud? 
Well, multi-party computation, yes, fully morphic encryption, I'm not sure. What kind of... Yeah, but, that's, but it makes no sense because if it's 100 times less efficient, I mean, we're now at a million, but 100 times less efficient, even 50 times less efficient, are you going to ship all your data to Google, let them do 50 times more work to then get the answer back? Yeah, if it's huge data, maybe, but the thing is, it's not even 50, right? It, today it's 50,000, so, so it, 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 there is no business model that really makes sense. Promising if you have a multi-tenant system where you have lots of people with data. But if all the data is encrypted with different keys, yeah. it doesn't work. And if you all use the public key of Google, then Google can decrypt anywhere, and then there is no point. So you have to, I mean, I'm always, I mean, on the one hand, I, of course, be research on this, but always when I meet researchers, I challenge them to find good business cases because I think there is good press releases, but not many good business cases. But I think, think about it, right? Well, if you had this, what could you do? But I think multi-party computation is a bit more useful. But I still think that it's much better to keep the data with you and prove that you do certain things. For some statistics, you have to put data together. But then I'm not sure that you can, if you put it all under Google's public key, right, and then you do calculations, and then who can decrypt? So maybe then Google has to share this key. I mean, you can think of things, but we have to really work this out and, and people just sell it and say, oh, I can do now crypto magic and I can solve all your problems. But this is wrong. So we should not, I think, it, this is my concern, in fact, that, I mean, if, we, if you were with funding research, you rather should be funding research on, on, on efficient and secure network level encryption, which is transparent, and on this kind of cool stuff. But of course, funding agencies will not give me money for this. If I want to go secure network encryption, they say, this is solved, guy, go away. That's the problem. And so this is why I make projects in the other area. And I try to use some money to do the, other, the, the important stuff or the, the more short-term need stuff. I, I saw this some press releases now that they say officially a lot of the leaks are now starting to hurt especially interest in America, cloud providers. Yes, so, of course. So they store the data, they process the data, but there's no assurances. Yes, so it's, I think it's, it's amazing to me why people trust the cloud. I've never understood this. Of course, it saves money. This I understand. I'm, I'm not so stupid, but I never understood this trust model. But okay, I'm just a naive cryptographer. I mean, I don't know. Coffee? Okay, enjoy your coffee break.